Hi there, this is Robin Norgren, and I am your host of Creativity, Montessori, and the Meaning of Life. You can find all my work on Instagram under Robin underscore Norgren or under at UBU for life. I'd like to start with some words from The Burning Word by Judith Kunst. She's talking about when she was first introduced to Midrash. My encounters with Jewish Midrash began when my writing teacher said to me, You are reading the Hebrew Bible, but are you reading it with Hebrew eyes? This teacher was not a rabbi. He was not a priest or even a biblical scholar. He was a writer interested in how language intersects with religion. In other words, how language can shape our experience of, our relationship with, a God we have never seen with our eyes or touched with our hands or talked with face to face. My teacher did not expect me to answer his question. He knew I was not reading with Hebrew eyes because he knew I was a Christian as he himself was. But he wanted to suggest to me that the tradition behind my own tradition, Judaism, had something vital to offer me as a writer and a reader and a seeker after God. I discovered as I began to explore what it meant to read the Bible in a different way a Jewish way, something vital. Perhaps not surprisingly, as I set out to encounter this different tradition, I found myself obliged to honestly and continually encounter my own. I couldn't learn to read in a Jewish way without also clearly defining the way a Christian, at least this Christian, reads. Two vivid images and two short texts culled both from my initial experience as a Christian and from my subsequent explorations of Judaism may help me explain what I mean. The first image is a 1970s style portrait of Jesus, cheaply produced yet lifelike and compelling, which hung in my room throughout my childhood. This Jesus had a friendly face with brown skin, unkept hippie-like hair, and eyes I could gaze at for hours. Gazing at Jesus never failed to fill me with a mixture of feelings joy and pain, peace and conflict, life and more life, that I felt nowhere else. Standing in front of that picture was my way of making real the text of an old hymn with which my mother used to sing me to sleep. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. As I turned my face towards those kind brown eyes on the wall, the particulars of my young life fuzzed and faded away. In those moments, the things of earth did indeed grow dim, and at the time, this seemed not only strange, but wonderful. My experience of reading the Bible back then, and for many years as an adult, often had a similar kind of grazing quality. I would pull the book from the shelf or the pew or the bedside table open it up either at random or at the thick section of psalms and flip the pages until I found something that struck me either as familiar or something relevant to my own life. Then I would read, sometimes a tiny passage, sometimes a chapter or two. Sometimes I was bored, reading just enough to be able to say I'd done it, fulfilled the mysteriously compelling obligation that evangelical churches had drummed into me since childhood, But sometimes I was far from bored. I was enchanted, pulled into the mysterious space I had come to recognize as uniquely God-filled. Later, as an adult, I would learn that the ancient Christian name for this kind of Bible reading is Lecta Divina, a form of meditation that allows everything extraneous to leave the mind and heart as the reader gazes on a single verse or word of Scripture. But by then, I wasn't interested in reading that took me away from what the old hymn called the things of earth. I wanted a Bible that would not dim or deny, but sharpen and welcome the particulars of the world I was coming to know. A world of blooming trees and shifting skies, a husband and a child, novels and poems and cancer and war, oceans, mountains, what's for dinner, Wall Street, Washington, the lie I told last night, I wanted to embrace these things and wrestle them into words. Eventually, 
I would find in the Jewish tradition a way of reading that vigorously welcomes both language and the world to the arena of scripture study. It's called Midrash, a Hebrew word meaning to search out. The Holy Scriptures abounds with gaps, abrupt shifts, and odd syntax that puzzles, even compounds, confounds any reader of Scripture. Jewish Midrash views this troubling irregularities not as accidents or errors or cultural disparities to be passed over, but rather as deliberate invitations to grapple with God's revealed word and by extension to grapple with God himself. Midrash reads the Hebrew Bible not for what is familiar, but for what is unfamiliar. Not for what's clear, but for what's unclear. And then wrestles with the text passionately, playfully, and reverently. Midrash views the Bible as one side of a conversation started by God, containing an implicit invitation, even command, to keep the conversation argument, story, poem, prayer, going. Austin Kleon says in his book, Steal Like an Artist, make friends, ignore enemies. There's only one rule I know of, you've got to be kind. Kurt Vonnegut. There's only one reason I'm here. I'm here to make friends. The golden rule is even more golden in our hyper-connected world. An important lesson to, work, to learn. If you talk about someone on the internet, they will find out. Everyone has a Google alert on their name. The best way to vanquish your enemies on the internet? Ignore them. The best fr- way to make friends on the internet? Say nice things about them. Stand next to the talent. The only mofos in my circle are people that I can learn from. Quest love. Remember garbage in, garbage out? You're only going to be as good as the people you surround yourself with. In the digital space, that means following the best people online. The people who are way smarter and better than you. The people who are doing the really interesting work. Pay attention to what they're talking about, what they're doing, what they're linking to. Harold Ramis, the actor and director most famous to people of my generation for his role as Egon in the movie Ghostbusters, once laid out his rule for success. Find the most talented person in the room, and if it's not you, go stand next to him. Hang out with him. Try to be helpful. Ramis was lucky. The most talented person in the room was his friend Bill Murray. If you ever find that you're the most talented person in the room, you need to find another room. You will need curiosity, kindness, stamina, and the willingness to be stupid. Quit picking fights and go make something. You're going to see a lot of stupid stuff out there. You're going to feel like you need to correct it. One thing I was, one time I was up late on my laptop and my wife yelled at me, Quit picking fights on Twitter and go make something. She was right. Anger is one of my favorite energy creative resources. Henry Rollins has said he is both angry and curious, and that's what keeps him going. Some mornings, when I can't wake up, I lie in bed and read email and Twitter until my blood starts boiling and I get fired up enough to spring out of bed. But instead of wasting my anger on complaining or lashing out at people, I try to channel it into my writing and my drawing. So go on, get angry, but keep your mouth shut and go do your work. Complain about the way other people make software by making software. Andre Torres. In Daniel Laporte's book, White Hot Truth, she says we naturally cycle through the phases of righteousness when we find truths that resonate with us. Righteousness can be such a cool thing, that fiery belief in something, the willingness to go all out for your cause, 
And sometimes it's totally obnoxious and your friends are like so overhearing about how the empowerment forum for the immediate enlightenment of humanity changed your life and how if they went, they totally get over their racket and be as expanded as you are. We get preachy with the new stuff. We also get angry and irrationally defiant. When I find out that veal came from baby cows kept in crippling crates to keep their meat tender, I protested family barbecues by aggressively eating salad and pontificating on animal cruelty. This doesn't really help the baby cows, and once I almost fainted from hunger at work. Fear and zealotry are cohorts. If we need to feel more secure in our new beliefs to have people's agreement affirm what we've chosen, then the soapbox is a great place to posture. It's also a great place to hide our fear that we could be wrong. Zealousness can be a healthy passage to becoming more mature and effective. We go extreme with some beliefs, but with experience and perspective, we hopefully come to even keel. The growth process and moderation begins when we aren't as desperate for people's approval. And hopefully our friends hang in there with us during our righteous highs. Timing counts for so much when it comes to discovering our truth. As individuals, we all are just bumping alongside each other with various beliefs and opinions. Who you are as a soul isn't always reflected back to you by your family or culture that you're born into. All the black sheep, please raise your hands. We can grow up on a diet of lies, ideas that we later discover we're allergic to, or in a stroke of good fortune and our excellent incarnational selection, we can grow up amongst life-affirming affirming ideologies that build our muscles for the work we've come to do on the planet. Either way, we can't use our upbringing or original culture to cruise control through life. Eventually, we have to examine the beliefs that drive us and start asking some questions, lots of them, and never stop asking, ever. Because the colossal, truth, life, truly life-threatening problem happens when we take a lie, provoke it into a paradigm, our whole worldview. And there is some nasty fiction that finds its way into every kind of belief system and flavor of faith, no matter how ancient, progressive, or holistic they may seem. They are fantastically flawed premises, and they keep us from self-acceptance, celebration, intimacy, and true connection that we crave. They are woven into the worst of dogmatic manipulation, marketing ploys, and political propaganda. And they drive our self-doubt and neurotic need for improvement and acceptance. You might want to go light a candle right now and wear something white and flowy or crank some heavy metal and get ready to rage. We're going to have a demolition party for these soul-sucking fabrications. Liberation is inevitable when you stop believing the lies. <laughs>